Each week in more than 200 countries around the world, Seventh-day Adventists go to church. We have the same beliefs and hopes and dreams, but we have very, very different cultures. Are those differences a threat to our unity or a strength for growth? Before I speak with my guest today, Julio Munoz has this report. Since its creation by the United Nations in 1948, Israel has known little peace. This ancient land has been divided and fought over between Israeli and Palestinian, Jew and Arab. In the midst of this arid and bleak land, the Adventist church seemed to have a difficult time growing. Until now, Richard Elifer, president of the Adventist church in Israel, has seen the church grow dramatically in his short tenure. When I arrived, the church had only 200, 250 members in 97. Today, we have 1,200 members worshiping every Sabbath in 25 churches and groups. What's astonishing about the rapid increase in membership is that it is the result of separating rather than uniting the country's ethnic groups. You know, when I arrived, uh, all the churches were uh, mixed all together, all the ethnic groups, and it was not very uh, positive for the evangelization of the Jews. His idea was to let each ethnic group evangelize its own people and worship in a culturally contextualized way. That would mean more than just holding services in their native language. Each group would worship in a style adapted to their own culture. Jewish Adventists, for example, would adopt a synagogue-style service. I start first to explain them for themselves. It will be better if they could have some uh, contextualized church. Since its creation, Israel has become home to immigrants from many countries, including Russia, Romania, Spain, Ghana, Ethiopia, and the Philippines. Elifer felt that the church's diversity would be its strength. We have seen many people coming in our church because they are in a foreign country here. They are speaking Russian, they are speaking Romanian, they are speaking Spanish. And every day in the week they are in a foreign context. And suddenly on Sabbath they can come to worship in their own language. The plan was a success and suddenly the church in Israel began to grow. In the past five years the number of congregations has grown from five to twenty-five and the number of church members from 220 to more than 1,200. Separating into ethnic groups has not splintered the Adventist church in Israel as some feared. Rather, it has grown closer together. Various groups gather regularly for joint worship services. Elifer is grateful for the opportunity he's been given and feels that one of the most rewarding parts of his work is the cultural diversity of the Adventist Church in Israel. For Adventist Newsline, this is Julio Munoz. My guest today is writer Clifford Goldstein. Thanks for being here, Clifford. Glad to be here. We've been watching this video about yeah. the church in Israel. Unity is supposed to be one of the identifying marks of the Adventist Church. How could we possibly be talking about dividing according to cultural groups? Well, I don't necessarily, what I saw happening on that film, which was very exciting, necessarily dividing the church. I don't see any real threat to unity here. I mean, we do come to the Lord from different cultures and from different backgrounds, and I don't think we're automatically expected just to throw all that out. I think as a church, we need to make a decision. We need to say to people, look, if you want to be a Seventh-day Adventist, you have to believe A, B, C, D, you have to do A, B, C, D, or not do, whatever it is, whatever those things are, we decide these are the things that make us Seventh-day Adventists and follow these and then outside of that I think we need to throw open the door for a whole lot of different cultures, a whole lot of different worship styles because this is where the people are when we meet them. I hear people all the time talking about taking the truth and repackaging it mm -hmm. so that it can be attractive to other people yeah. but aren't we running the risk of tampering with truth itself? Oh yeah, itself? the risk is there. I mean you look at a whole history of Christian apostasy all through the ages so often through history they took the truth and they compromised it to try to reach the um. Now that's the bad culture. word, compromise. Yeah, yeah, but see, I don't think that has to do that. Again, it comes back, we come back to these, quote, for lack of a better term, these fundamentals. What are the things that we need to believe or to do or whatever they are, whatever who's, whoever decides that decides, to, that makes us Seventh-day Adventists, that gives us our identity as Adventists. And then, with that as the foundation, then we open up to people who are going to express their understanding of God, express their love of Jesus, express their worship in different ways, ways that might in some ways make some of us feel a little bit uncomfortable. I mean, I think, I personally, 
might have been very uncomfortable with the worship styles that they might have had thousands of years ago in ancient Israel. But I'm just used to a certain worship style, and I don't see anything in my Bible which tells us that we have to worship God in the exact style of 19th, 18th, 19th century Americans. When I sit down and watch the TV uh, news in the evening, I see the results of division all over the world, animosity, hatred, terrorism. Aren't we running the risk also of playing into the hands of division when we're dividing ourselves? Well, ag the yeah, church? again, the risk is there. I mean, whatever you do, there's a certain amount of risk in whatever anything you do. But again, as we saw in Israel, I could have seen people a few years ago saying, no, you can't do that, you can't do that, and look at the results. Look, in other words, why make it hard? We ought to try to make it as easy as possible for people to join our church. And yet at the same time, we have our standards. We've got these things that we can't move on. But why put up a bunch of extra barriers that aren't, don't need to be there, even if we might find some of those things a little offensive to us? I've heard you share your own story. You grew up in an urban environment, Jewish and you had quite a cultural leap uh, to take uh, when you became a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of very big barriers there, things that made it very difficult for me. And praise the Lord, through the grace of God, I was able to work through that. And I'm thinking, what can we do to try to keep back as many of those barriers as we can? And it's a give and take kind of thing. If somebody is worshiping in a certain way that offends us, okay, well, you know, we need to chill out a little bit, you know, unless they're really doing something, you know, sinful or wrong, you know, maybe it makes us offensive, but at the, we might find that offensive or uncomfortable, but at the same time, too, there's the flip side where if I'm worshiping God and my culture is doing something that's bothering someone else, I need to be aware of that and sensitive to that, and without compromising what I believe is so important, maybe find a balance So this there. really comes out of a passion, out of your own experience. You're saying knock down the barriers, hold fast to the truth, and more people can, can be one to Christ. Is yeah, that what you're saying? Yeah, And uh, you know, what those exact barriers are, what those exact rules are, I'm not even going to begin to say that, what, you, know, what, what, you know, what they should be. But I think the principle, again, comes back to what are the things that make us who we are as Adventists? Cling to them, hold on to them no matter what, and then everything else we have to take a look at. And, you know, you can't just make some broad sweeping thing. You have to look at everything in each, you know, in the context and the culture, you know, and so on and so forth. And uh, we should make it as easy as we can for people to come in to our message, not as hard as we can with a bunch of artificial barriers that our own culture, so we think it should be done a certain way, but we're still we're putting reaching our, others, not yeah, ourselves. Yeah, and we're still putting our own culture then as the norm. You know, what makes ours the norm and not someone else's. Absolutely. So, so. Clifford Goldstein, thank you very much. Yeah, glad to be here.